Hello, I'm Omar Fred. Let's kick up. Okay, fine. Fine, welcome everyone. This is a continuation of a lesson that we had started on earlier, which is reception, response, and coordination. The subtopic of today will be the cranial nerves, then spinal cord. So subtopics. So today we look at uh, what cranial nerves are, types of cranial nerves, then later on come to spinal cord. So let's start off with cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are special types of neurons which emerge from the brain and extend and come into contact with individual body organs. There are several types of cranial nerves that are connected to several different body organs as we look into later on. Some of the cranial nerves are auditory nerve, olfactory nerve, Vagus nerve, and optic nerve, among others. So I'll only look into these three types of cranial nerves. As I mentioned before, cranial nerves are neurons that connect the brain and specific body organs. In total, there are about 12 pairs of cranial nerves, but here I'll only give four examples. Auditory nerves, or auditory nerve, these are neurons that connect the brain to the ears. So you have auditory nerve that will connect the left ear to the brain, and another one that will connect the right ear to the brain. Olfactory nerves are neurons that connect or link the brain and the nose. And that simply means once the nose, which is a sense organ, has detected or produced a nerve impulse, that nerve impulse will be transmitted to the brain through olfactory nerve. Then you have vagus nerve. Vagus nerve link the heart to the brain. That means the rate at which the heart beats can be increased or slowed down by the brain through vagus nerve. And then you have the optic nerve. Optic nerves are two. We have one optic nerve that links the right eye to the brain and another one that links the left eye to the brain. So optic nerves link eyes to the brain. So those four are enough to serve as examples of cranial nerves. So in summary, cranial nerves link the brain to various body organs. Examples of cranial nerves, auditory nerve links the ears to the brain olfactory nerves link the nose to the brain, vagus nerve link the heart to the brain, and optic nerve link the eyes to the brain. Next subtopic would be spinal cord. Spinal cord is an extension of the brain. It is found on the posterior lower end of the brain. 
If this diagram is to represent the brain, then this left side will present the anterior part of the brain, right side will present the posterior back part of the brain. The spinal cord, therefore, is an extension of the lower part of the brain. It's usually small in size, but then on the upper part where it terminates from the brain is usually broad, and as it moves down the spinal column, it reduces in size. So it's wide or broad at the neck region and very small towards the caudal or tail region. Spinal cord is part of the central nervous system and therefore it also plays a role in integration of nerve impulses. That means spinal cord will give nerve impulses specific meanings. That is what we call integration. The spinal cord is usually made up of two main parts. It has gray matter and white matter. Let me draw a diagram here to present the spinal cord. Fine. This diagram here now represents the spinal cord. This shaded part here is known as gray matter. The section that is not shaded, white matter. The upper part is known as dorsal root. and the lower end is known as ventral root. The constriction on the upper part, dorsal fissure. The constriction on the lower end, ventral fissure. Then, the neuron located on the dorsal root is known as sensory neuron. The neuron located on the ventral side is known as motor neuron. The neuron that is located inside the gray matter is known as intermediate neuron or relay neuron.
Then the middle part here is known as central canal. Fine. So this diagram here represents spinal cord. Spinal cord has white matter, a section here and here, label is white matter. Then you have the shaded part known as gray matter. This shaded part is known as gray matter because it appears dark in color. What makes it appear dark in color is the presence of cell bodies of motor neuron and intermediate neuron along with their dendrites. So the dendrites of intermediate neuron, sensory neuron, along with cell bodies of intermediate neuron and cell body of motor neuron, all those along with small granules suspended within the gray matter makes it appear gray in color. Gray matter appears H in shape. This H-shaped gray matter has a central part which has a hole. This central part which has a hole is known as central canal. Inside central canal, there is a fluid known as cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is also found within the brain. The fluid keeps both brain and spinal cord moist. Apart from keeping brain and spinal cord moist, it is also the point where exchange of nutrients and waste products take place. That means nutrients will be discharged in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid and then supplied to the brain and spinal cord. Once the cells of the brain and spinal cord have made use of the nutrients, waste products are produced, like carbon dioxide gas and urea. Waste products that are produced by the brain and cells of the spinal cord will then enter into cerebrospinal fluid, from where they will enter into blood capillaries, then transported to excretory organs. Then we have the white matter. This section, this other section. That part of spinal cord that is known as white matter appears white in color due to the presence of myelin sheaths of motor neuron and myelin sheath of sensory neuron. The myelin sheaths of motor neuron and myelin sheaths of sensory neurons reflect a lot of light and that makes white matter to appear shiny and white in color. From the diagram, you can see that various neurons do not come into contact with one another. For example, the dendrites of sensory neuron have a space between them and the dendrites of intermediate neuron. The dendrites of intermediate neuron also have spaces between them and dendrites of motor neuron. These spaces are known as synapse or neurojunction. A synapse or neurojunction is a space between terminal dendrites of different neurons where they come into close contact with one another. So we have synapse here, 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 here. So that simply means neurons never come into contact with one another. Then, as I mentioned before, the upper part of the spinal cord is known as dorsal root. The lower part is known as ventral root. On the ventral side, we have motor neuron. On the dorsal side, we have sensory neuron. Then the depressions. The depression on the upper part, dorsal fissure. Depression on the lower side, ventral fissure. When nerve impulse is to move or to be transmitted along sensory neuron, it will move from left hand side towards the right hand side until the nerve impulse is taken to the gray matter for integration. 
the integrated nerve impulse will then enter into intermediate neuron. Intermediate neuron will transmit the integrated uh, nerve impulse to motor neuron. Motor neuron will then conduct the integrated nerve impulse to effectors. So here we have receptors, here we have effectors. So receptors receive the nerve impulse and then convey it over to the sensory neuron which takes it to CNS for integration. Integrated message will then enter into intermediate neuron which conveys the integrated message to motor neuron. Motor neuron relays the integrated message to effectors which could be the eyelids or muscles of the body. Now that uh, we've seen the diagram of the spinal cord, I want, us to, I want to explain how nerve impulse moves along spinal cord. I'll start off by explaining what reflex action is. Reflex action simply means a rapid automatic response due to a particular stimulus. So reflex action, rapid automatic response due to a particular stimulus. Reflex action can be divided into two. We have simple reflex action and two, conditioned reflex action. So these two are the only types of reflex action that we can talk about, simple reflex action and conditioned reflex action. Simple reflex action is a rapid automatic response due to a particular type of stimulus that is independent of learning. That means one does not have to be taught about simple reflex action. For example, when one touches a hot object, you feel pain. That means ne one was never taught how to feel pain, but it happens automatically. When onions are cut close to the eyes, an, individual, an individual's eyes will respond by shedding tears. Simple reflex action. So simple reflex action is rapid automatic response due to a particular stimulus that is independent of learning. Condition reflex action is rapid automatic response due to a particular stimulus that is dependent on learning. What that means is condition reflex action cannot take place until an individual is taught or a particular stimulus is repeated several times, then an individual will be able to relate the new stimulus to a particular action. For example, writing. One cannot learn to write within one day. It takes quite some time and the process of writing has to be repeated several times for one to be able to write. I'll start off with the details or components of reflex action, then come to the details of each and every type of reflex action by itself. So there is what we call reflex arc. Reflex arc simply refers to components of reflex action. That is, for that rapid automatic response to take place, what are the components that will be involved? So the components of reflex action is what we refer to as reflex arc. Reflex arc comprises of receptors, sensory neuron,
CNS, that's brain and spinal cord. Intermediate neuron. Motor neuron. And effectors. So, the six uh, components or the six uh, types of structures that form simple reflex arc are receptors, which will receive or perceive the stimulus, sensory neuron, a nerve cell that will conduct the nerve impulse from the receptors to central nervous system for integration, central nervous system made up of the brain and spinal cord, where the nerve impulse will be integrated. Intermediate neuron, a nerve cell that links sensory neuron to motor neuron through central nervous system. Motor neuron, the nerve cell that transmits integrated nerve message or impulse to the effectors. Effectors, specialized cells or tissues or organs that bring about the change that is needed. So, from the diagram of the spinal cord, Receptors here could be the skin found at the tip of the fingers, sensory neuron, the nerve impulse that transmits nerve impulse to the central nervous system. Central nervous system, here it's represented by spinal cord. Intermediate neuron, a nerve cell that links sensory neuron to motor neuron. Here it is, intermediate neuron, also known as relay neuron. Motor neuron, the nerve impulse that will transmit integrated nerve impulse to the effectors, which are body tissues or organs that will bring about the change that is needed. Then effectors, tissues or organs that bring about the desired change. So I'll give an example of simple reflex action based on touching a hot object. Yeah, so when one touches a hot object, take for example, if I take this whiteboard marker to be a hot object, when I touch the hot object, then high temperature from the object will serve as stimulus. The stimulus will generate a nerve impulse. That nerve impulse that is generated will be detected by the skin. The skin will then transmit the, uh, the stimulus to the sensory neuron. Sensory neuron will conduct nerve impulse to the spinal cord. The gray matter of the spinal cord will integrate that particular uh, uh, nerve impulse. It will give it a meaning, for example, high temperature or hot and harmful. After the gray matter of the spinal cord has integrated the nerve impulse, the integrated nerve impulse will enter into intermediate neuron. Intermediate neuron will then pass over the integrated nerve impulse to motor neuron. Motor neuron will then take the integrated nerve impulse to the biceps and triceps, in which biceps will contract and triceps will relax. If biceps contract and triceps relax, then the arm is withdrawn from the hot, harmful object. So in that case, receptors, which in this case we talked about the skin on the fingers, will receive or detect the stimulus, convey the stimulus to sensory neuron. 
sensory neuron will take it to the gray matter of the spinal cord for integration. The integrated nerve impulse will then enter into intermediate neuron. Intermediate neuron will transmit the integrated nerve impulse to motor neuron. Motor neuron will, will convey the integrated nerve impulse to the, effect to the effectors. Effectors in this case, biceps and triceps, which respond by contracting, making the arm to be withdrawn. So that's an example of simple reflex action in which we've talked about the various components and how the desired change, that is withdrawal of the arm, is brought about. There are several examples of simple reflex actions. Some of them could be response due to contact or touching a sharp object or stepping on a hot, ob I mean sharp object. When individual steps on a sharp object, that sharp object will serve a stimulus which will generate a nerve impulse. Nerve impulse will be transmitted to the sensory neuron which will conduct it to the spinal cord for integration. Spinal cord, the gray matter will integrate the nerve impulse. Integrated nerve impulse will be taken to intermediate neuron. From intermediate neuron, passed over to motor neuron. From motor neuron, the muscles of the thighs are the ones that will contract, making the foot to be lifted away from the sharp object that an individual will have stepped on. Other examples of simple reflex action, blinking of the eyes when an object passes closed. For example, when a fly passes close to the eyes, an individual blinks or shuts the eyelids almost instantly. That's another example of simple reflex action. Shedding of tears when onions are being cut close to the eyes, that's also another example of simple reflex action. Then I'll give an example using conditioned reflex action. For conditioned reflex action, this is a rapid automatic response due to unrelated repeated stimulus. For example, in his research, a Russian scientist by the name of Ivan Pavlov used dogs in his research. We know that normally, Dogs do salivate at the sight of food. Or smell of food. So when a dog is hungry and then a dog sees food, it begins to salivate. Saliva trickles down from the tongue of the dog downwards. A dog will also salivate when it gets the smell of food and it's hungry. So normally salivation in dogs is brought about by sight of food and smell of food. In this case they use optic nerve and olfactory nerve. Those are the main neurons that link the eyes to the brain for the smell. Olfactory nerve will link nose to the brain. In even Pavlov's research, he could always present the dogs with food and then ring a bell. So all the times that he could provide the dogs with food, he would ring a bell. He did that several times. That means smell of food, sight of food was accompanied by sound of the bell. Later on, he discovered that any given moment that he would ring the bell, at the time when the dogs were supposed to be provided food or supplied with food, he could see the dogs salivating. Now in this case, salivation was brought about by sound of bell. 
Sound in this case is unrelated stimulus. The stimulus here originally was sight of food or smell of food. These two are the ones that we call primary stimuli. But sound of the bell, which is not related to salivation, now takes over sight and smell of food. But for dogs to be able to relate sound of the bell and food, the stimulus had to be repeated several times. That means conditioned reflex action is dependent on repeated stimuli at the same time it depends on learning. So there are two main factors here which are considered in conditioned reflex action. There is repeated stimuli and there is also learning. And something that is learned can easily be forgotten. That means if the dogs are, I mean, if a sound of the bell is stopped for several months or several years, the dogs will later on not be able to relate sound of bell and food. So it means that sound of bell will only serve for a particular duration, but it can easily be extinguished when the stimulus is not repeated several times. So conditioned reflex action, rapid automatic response due to unrelated stimulus that is repeated several times. Give an example of Ivan Pavlov's work using dogs in which mention that salivation is in dogs is brought about by sight of food and smell of food. The main nerve cells involved, optic nerve for the eyes, olfactory nerve for the nose. But when, sound, when smell and sight of food was replaced by sound, in this case now we have auditory nerve serving us the main channel that connects sound to the brain. So in condition reflex action, primary sensory neurons are replaced by secondary sensory neuron. Secondary sensory neuron simply means a nerve cell that never used to link the initial stimulus to the brain. Like in this case, auditory nerve never used to link the brain of the dog to food and therefore it could not bring about salivation. But now in this case, the sound of the bell was accompanied by sight of food and smell of food. But later on, when sight and smell of food were removed and then replaced by sound, sound now became the stimulus for salivation. So for conditioned reflex action, there is repeated stimuli, it has to be repeated several times, and then it's also dependent on learning. Fine. What are, what are some of the significance of conditioned reflex action? How is conditioned reflex action important to our daily lives? The applications of conditioned reflex action, one, it's used in training of dogs. Training of dogs. Two, it's used to improve learning in schools and mastery of subject contents. That means when a child or a toddler is being taught how to read or how to write, that process of reading or writing will have to be repeated several times. After being repeated several times, then the young child will be able to know how to move the hands or fingers while writing. At the same time, they'll also be able to read maybe two-letter words, three-letter words, four-letter words, and then later on, they will be able to master how to read, 
how to write or how to carry out some calculations in mathematics. So condition reflex action has those two main applications, but not the only ones. Condition reflex action is also used in teaching or training people how to drive motor vehicles, how to ride bicycles, because the process is usually repeated several times until the individual being taught or the learner masters the concepts. Then, what are the differences between conditioned reflex action and simple reflex action? So let's look at differences between simple reflex action and conditioned reflex action. One, condition reflex action is dependent on learning. Simple reflex action is independent of learning. For example, one was never born with the ability to read and write. So reading and writing had to be taught to an individual and it had to be repeated several times. A certain process had to be repeated several times for an individual to grasp. But for simple reflex action, for example, cutting onions close to an individual's eyes, an individual will end up shedding tears. Nobody's ever taught that. While cutting onions, you have to shed tears. It happens automatically, independent of learning. Second difference. Repeated stimulus. To bring about the desired change. That is repeated stimulus to bring about the change that is needed. This other one, single stimulus. Brings about desired change or response. What this means is, in conditioned reflex action, the stimulus has to be repeated several times. For example, in the case of Ivan Pavlov, for the dogs to be able to relate sound of the bell and food, the bell had to be rung several times and it had to be accompanied with food. In that way, the dogs learned to relate food and sound of the bell. So the stimulus had to be repeated several times. Even while riding, training a child to ride a bicycle, it does not just happen all of a sudden. It has to be repeated several times. Same to driving. So, in conditioned reflex action, the stimulus is repeated many times for the change that is needed to take place. In simple reflex action, a single stimulus brings about the change that is needed. For example, when one touches a hot or sharp object, the individual responds instantly. That means it's just a single touch that brings about the chain that is needed. If, if an object, for example, a fly passes close to the eyes of an individual, the eyes are blinked almost instantly, meaning a single stimulus is what brings about the desired change. Then the last 
difference. For condition reflex action, the primary sensory neuron is substituted by secondary sensory neuron. In this case, if we pick on the case of the dog, the primary sensory neurons were two that brought about salivation. Observation of food, here we talk about optic nerve. Smell of food, we talk about olfactory nerve. So optic nerve and olfactory nerves, those two are primary sensory components that bring about salivation of dogs at the sight of food and smell of food. But when the sound of the bell replaces sight of food and smell of food for salivation to take place, then it means now we talk about auditory nerve taking over or taking over the responsibility of optic nerve and olfactory nerve. So for conditioned reflex action, primary sensory components are replaced by secondary sensory components. Giving example of optic nerve and olfactory nerves bringing about salivation in dogs, but now it has been replaced with auditory nerve, which brings about salivation in dogs. So primary components have been substituted by secondary sensory components. The motor components remain the same. In simple reflex action, primary sensory components remain the same. They don't change. They remain the same. Fine. That marks the end of our lesson today. And the two subtopics that we looked into were cranial nerves and spinal cord. The cranial nerves, we mentioned, they are neurons that link the brain and specific body organs. Spinal cord, we mentioned, is an extension of the posterior lower end of the brain. So in our next lesson, we look at transmission of nerve impulse, how nerve impulse moves along an axon. Thank you.